Just a heads up, this episode deals with adult content. And if after listening to it, you are feeling impacted, please contact 1-800-RESPECT or Lifeline on 13 11 14. Hi, I'm Mia Friedman, and this is the No Filter Podcast, real stories you won't be able to stop listening to. It's kind of hard for me to describe my guest today because she is so incredibly visual in everything she does, from the way she writes so descriptively to the -the over-the-top, gloriously fancy dress way that she presents herself to the world and, of course, to the clothes she designs. I first met Alana Hill when I interviewed her over 20 years ago now for a magazine. And at the time, she was one of the biggest fashion designers in the country. Being a magazine editor, part of your job is to go to a lot of fashion shows, And I was always struck by how very sort of samey and soulless they felt. Every time it was the same thing. Tall, painfully underweight girls stomping down a catwalk looking bored or sometimes strangely pissed off. But when you went to an Alana Hill show, she used dancers instead of models to showcase her clothes, which meant that there was dancing and joy and fun and different kinds of bodies. And the atmosphere always changed instantly with all the sort of jaded fashion people and magazine people visibly perking up. It was so much fun to go to an Alana Hill show or to go to an Alana Hill shop. It was full of like, well, it still is, I guess, full of sparkly things and girly things and feathers and flowers and frills and just prints and just it's so unashamedly girly as a brand. When Alana came in for this interview, a lot had changed in that 20 years or so since I delighted at her fashion shows. She's had a baby and she's raised him as a single mum after his dad walked out the same week that he was born. She's also lost her beloved business, her mother, and for a while, her identity. And now she's written a memoir called Butterfly on a Pin. Alana Hill is 55 now, but don't tell anyone. And for what may seem like the millionth time to her, Alana Hill has reinvented herself again. There's been a huge amount of hardship and tragedy in her life, and she's ready to talk about it. Here's Alana Hill. Alana Hill, welcome and congratulations. You can Thank write, you, Mia. girlfriend. Thank you. I can't accept many compliments, but I will accept that one. You should. I do. I will. Because the story of your book is extraordinary enough, but the way you've written it is beautiful and engaging and funny and just Poy- original. It's really original. It it's I'm really a, I'm fresh. I'm a trailblazer, love. A you trailblazer. Are, you are, dull. I am. Um, is, is there a question there? Or no. Is it a no? statement? Yeah, so yeah. I'm trying to answer your statement. You can statement, just take is... that as a comment, Thank as you, Tony loves. Jones would say. Yeah. <laughs> now, I'm looking at you and it's a real shame that this podcast is not a visual medium because you are, as ever, a treat. Can you just describe what you're wearing and how long it took you, like the process of putting your, your makeup and doing your hair today? Oh, Mia. It is it is a constant burden because as I get older, it's taking me three times as long to look half as good. Because I have issues with no one seeing me without makeup or dolled up, I wake up always tense. And my boyfriend, like a husband, that, that boyfriend seems to immature for How him. How long have you been together? Eight years. Mm. So it's, I hate partner. I don't like Has boyfriends. he seen you without makeup? He thinks he has. <laughs> <laughs> But he hasn't, and I would. I, I haven't even seen myself without makeup for a long time, love. And it did all came about from reinventing myself when I was abused when I was younger. Is but it I, a mask? Oh yes, it is. It is such a mask, but it it, it also helps me get through because people think, oh, what people used to say, I dare you tomorrow to wear no makeup, and I'd be like. I dare you tomorrow to cut your ears off because that's what it would be like for me. Mm. I, I, I've, I, I felt so ugly and so small and insignificant. But on the top of that, I also had a lot of vim and, and, and vibe and personality and, and I'll show you, I'll show you all, Mum and Dad. I'll show you all. I didn't know how I was going to show them, but I showed them I was going to. And... The mask is like this morning I was getting ready and 
usually I suss out the hotel if the, if the, if, the boy, if my boyfriend's coming to see if there's two rooms. Uh, he has to go to the executive club to go to the bathroom because I don't like to hear him. I don't like to hear the trickle. Of Even me, for number I'm one, into oh, about yeah. it, and he, he's quite good about it. So you're not a door open in the bathroom kind of a gal. He doesn't even think I've got a bottom. <laughs> for some reason, I've convinced him I don't have a bottom. And if you do, nothing's ever come out of it. No, and I've also convinced him I've got the best body in Melbourne because I have, there's candles lit. I'm not seen naked. I'm in some sort of a lovely lingerie situation. I'm on my back. Everyone looks quite good lying on their back. Is that really rude to say that? I'm sorry, listeners, but I'm just giving you some Except tips here. Except when your boobs go under each arm. I wear a bra to bed. Oh, during sex also. Sure, love. Mm. And it works quite well because, thankfully, he likes... It, it, I don't think being naked is that sexy. I don't. I don't think... Unless you're under 40. I'm in the Diane Arbus age bracket, so I've got to be very careful with the lighting. How old are you now? I don't know. I, I tell you, if I say the, the two numbers, I may have a heart attack. Okay. It's something, I know there's a five and okay. I think there may be another five. There, I've said it. Okay. Put them together and I'm ten. It's a good age. Divide by two and I'm five. Ten divided by two, five. No. Yeah, yeah. How long does it take you to put your face on or do you never oh. take it off so it's just maintenance of your makeup? No, well, if Hugo stays over... I can look a little bit wrecked in the morning. Because so, your makeup's on your pillow. And it's a little bit over my face. And I, I, if, I do quite like – it's not really the makeup on my face. It's my eyes and not even my lips. It's my eyes. They have to shine. I, I can't let them see into my eyes because I'm, I'm worried what they might see. You've got beautiful eyes. My sister told me once when I was little that I had sultana eyes. Not a sultana, a little brown dot of a thing. Who wants a sultana eye? So I've mesmerised that sultana into a jewel. I'm a jewel sultana. And lots of hair. Is it all yours? Yes. Ish. Ish. I, I cut it myself. Mm. I put hot rollers in every morning for the last, God, 30 years. I've gone through so many hot rollers. I carry them with me. Hugo is always like... Because they take up half the suitcase. They're big. They're on. They're on heat all the time. They're always on. Not on heat like in a, a dog or a cat, but they're on. They're on all the time. So I have to go back to the hotel at some stage today and reset and re-tease. Because if I start to fall flat, I start to feel young, like a child again, like I was was when I was small. And that makes you feel vulnerable because that's when you're abused. It does. I feel very vulnerable, and this does. This empower. This does empower me. And I think it empowers a lot of girls. And that's why I, I think that men are very silly when they say, oh, my girlfriend just likes shopping. She just likes shopping. And I think you've got no idea what goes on with that shopping. It's not shopping. We're thinking, we're brooding, we're wondering, we're looking at people, we're taking each other out a twist, we're learning about ourselves. It's not just shopping. It is a whole psychology. As a child, did you like to dress up? Yes, I did. But I, when I was, a, when what happened to me on the train, and the listeners, you, when you buy the book, which you will after this because you'll love it, you will notice that something terrible happened to me when I was twelve mm. by a brother, who I don't speak to, who was born in a shock condition. So I always felt quite sorry for him. He and was he, born in a shock condition in the early late sixties. A shock condition meant your legs came out first. Ah, oh, bre- sort of breach. Yes, and so worse. he didn't get enough oxygen. But mm. he's, you know, so I wasn't, I wasn't, uh, didn't wear makeup at twelve or anything. But as soon as that happened, and my nan greeted me on the train that in Hobart, where we, we had to travel to Hobart with him for eight hours, so it was an eight-hour grueling. I still can't look at a train. Um, he was older than you. He's fifteen. And you were 12. I was 12. Yeah. The abuse seems to... Uh, I'm always amazed how much abuse, how sexual abuse can affect someone. Like, you, you, you can you can cut a baby, you can... To a 12-year-old, you can leave them on the side of the road for hours. But if, if sexual abuse cuts to the core of something that I... 
that's unexplained. It's, it's, it's indescribable. Is it your relationship with your own body? I don't know what it does. I don't, yeah, I think that really haunts you because you start to think that it's dirty. And I, I, I'll always be haunted by it. It, it would mm. never... And, and I don't blame my brother because I, I know that he would have had no idea the impact of what he did would have on me because... It, because there were so many other things going on in that family home that was so diabolical that he, I don't think he knew it. He, he thought he just snatched the rest of my pathetic little childhood out of my heart and it, there, there was not a lot left. Did, so you, I, did I, your mum believe you when you told her? I didn't tell her for a long time. I, I told Why not? <laughs> because, love, if you told my mother anything, if you... This is this is how my the day with my mother would go. Uh, we were in the milk bar. It was open seven days a week. You lived in a town called Penguin. Penguin. We used to live and in... And you a, had a milk bar. But Yes, we did. Very idyllic. It was the 70s. Everyone thought it was idyllic. And I, I had friends for at least six years with a milk bar. I was stealing the lollies, taking them down to the, uh, to the toilets at the school because otherwise I wouldn't have had any friends. And I, I don't know why I didn't have any friends. I think I said in the book that uh, on good days, I think it's because I was a fast runner. <laughs> and on bad days, I think it's because my family had a bad reputation. <laughs> but I, I, didn't, I couldn't make friends. I still don't really make friends well. I don't have very many friends. And I, I comfort myself that I'm still a fast runner <laughs> and <laughs> that my family had a bad reputation. <laughs> but I, I, I can't... I, I've risen above and reinvented myself as much as I can from that incident and I left home very early at 15 because I couldn't be around him and I couldn't tell anybody and I that's where the dressing up came in I I went into the bathroom maybe three two or three days after it happened and I thought I I looked at myself and I couldn't breathe I I just thought I and I was running from room to room there's only two rooms at the back of the milk bar and I couldn't hide from him so I thought, I'm going to turn myself into a completely different person. It's a wonder I didn't change my name, actually. But I came out with mum's curtains over me, ridiculous makeup, ludicrous hairdo. I looked a little bit like a, a scared tip rat. And I came out and mum was sitting smoking and, and I'd say, I said, Mum, I am never, ever taking this off. And she smoked three packets of cigarettes a day, which is a lot. Mm. So the, the, the lounge room or the, the two rooms where we lived – at the back of the milk bar was it was it was a sea of smoke. It was like a nightclub. You couldn't really see Mum in the corner, but there she was with her Peter Stavardson, and she was very unhappy and miserable, and 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 her put downs were apocalyptic, apocalyptic, and she would just say, "Oh man, you look red." Ridiculous! Get that muck off your face and what are you going to do all day today, Land dear? You've got nowhere to go. No one's ringing for you, dear. You haven't got any hobbies, Land. No one likes you, dear. What's wrong with your head, Land? It's so small. It's the size of an apple, dear. You're going to have to go higher with your... You need a perm. You've got to get a perm. Mum, I don't think a perm is very good. So I had to go in grade nine. I went off and got a perm where I looked like the laughing stock. Of the whole of the high school, and and mum was and dad, dad dad was never there. He was drunk and uh, quite abusive, and but I, the, I I have sort of sorrow for them. I I, I don't hate them. I, I really don't. I I I, I love mum because she was she was a card. You do and a I, great impersonation of her, and she's such a character through. The book that it almost seems like she's a voice in your head whether you're actually talking to her and you phone her because you get out of Tasmania you make this life for yourself in Melbourne you become internationally famous as a fashion designer <laughs> unspeakably successful in you the really fashion did. industry and mum and dad didn't think mum still thought I worked in a store on Chapel Street and how's that little store going then at one point when you say yeah. You're in New York and, mm. and you've been you've sold to all these department stores in New York and you ring her and you say, Mum, I'm on Fifth Avenue in New York. And what does she say? <laughs> my, my clothing was in the window of Henry Mandel's, the best department store in New York. I was so delighted. I stood out the front. I, I rang her on my little Prada phone I had. And first of all, I said, Mum, I'm in New York. And she said, how, how can you 
be in New York with that little tiny toy phone you've got. You're not in New York. You're in Melbourne. I said, no, Mum, I'm in New York. I'm on the Fifth Avenue and my clothes are in the window, Mum. Uh, they're in the window with my name on, in lights. She said, Fifth Avenue? Oh, lad, you didn't make it to first, dear. You only came fifth. What a shame. <laughs> <laughs> now... The, the put downs were so superb oh. that you, you, you couldn't uh, you couldn't read about it. And once my brother come home, that was that was, it was constant. It was constant. Even when I had Edward, he's not going to amount to anything much, dear. Oh, he's walking all over you. Don't spoil him, dear. You're playing with him too much. What's his name, William? I don't like his eyes. And Len, don't bring me in ten years' time. He's in jail because I know he's going to end up in jail, Len. Ah. When you channel your mum, yep. you hold an imaginary That's, cigarette. I do, I do. Every time you talk about I her, do. your hands go I up do. as if you're holding a cigarette. I do. When I went to therapy for two years, he tried to make me stop. He said, sit on your hands and do her but without it, the cigarette. It's inextricably linked. Couldn't That's do it. her. Your I whole d- posture said, I, changes. I, I, I dropped him after that. After two hours, I thought, I'm going to drop you, therapist. How dare you make me sit on my hands and not <laughs> have my cigarette, my, my fake cigarette. Was being as successful in the fashion industry... As exciting as you thought it would be? Because you were it. See, uh, Did it feel like you were it when you were it? The sad thing is that when, when people talk about you that you were it, yeah. you suddenly think, <laughs> oh, no, I'm not. And I should have enjoyed it more than I was. And I didn't know I was because I was a little bit, a little bit f***ed up. So I'm having a lot of trouble on this book tour. A little bit because people talking about your success being in the past tense. A bit, and I'm like, I- I've I've written this book, and they go, I loved your clothes, I loved what you were, um, I, and I know that they mean now, but I'm so that label and that brand meant so much to me. That it, it's more painful than anything. At the height of your success, you had dozens of boutiques. Like dozens or <laughs> boutiques, well, as you call them. Boutiques. The well, the, the issue I think there is that a lot of people don't realise that I didn't own Alana Hill. I was a employee of a big company called Factory X. Is that from the start? When I was at Indigo, I had my own labour within the store. I remember Indigo and Chapel Street. Oh. <laughs> and that That's was where it. you started as that a shop girl. I did as a hippie. I couldn't believe it. I rang mum and said, Mum, I've got a job in a shop. I've got it. She said... <laughs> Fingers come up. Cigarette. <laughs> yeah, it, it was like, a shop girl, Jimmy, Jimmy, lands a shop girl and she's got a part in a film and she's going to be a dog in space. That was with Michael Hutchins. <laughs> yes, but I'll, I'll answer that because you had a really good question. You were in Indigo. You were a shop girl and you had your own label. I did and Indigo were nice enough not to trademark that name, which was nice of them. So I left Indigo with the name and then went to... I couldn't get a job at the Bournemouth Cinema. I couldn't get a job at the Astor Cinema as a, as a candy cane girl. I, did, I was really distressed because I thought, what, what do I do after Indigo? And then I met up with David Heaney, who owned Dangerfield, and he said, oh, why don't you come? We'll just try you out. We'll, ju- we'll just try you out. You know, we'll just uh, you just put a few clothes together, uh, do a range, and uh, maybe we'll open a shop on Greville Street. And I, I thought, and straight away I thought, Greville Street, no, it's got to be Chapel Street. It's got to be near Indigo because they'd sort of let me go after 16 years because I I was like Alice in Wonderland. I was, uh, I was the shop was this big. I was, I'd grown out uh, and they let me go. And I, it was good that they did. And I thought it's got to be Chapel and so he funded the first store and then within five years there was eight and we'd always talk about them and we'd talk about everything. I, got, I, I was the king of the, the queen of the castle there. How much did you own of 20, your business? 25%, which isn't quite really quite enough to do anything much. So you didn't have the final say over anything? I did for a long time. I did. Like David really, if, if you, he, he was. He, when things are going well. He's, if you're making money, you can do anything. You can go first class, you can do anything. But it's with all businesses, as soon as things are, and then I blamed him, he blamed me. It was like a, a hard divorce. Mm. But I, I didn't, I didn't realise that, actually I did realise that 
I knew him well enough by then to know that how will I get my name back because I don't quite know how this I, I still I didn't know how it worked for those and I can't imagine there would be many people who don't know what your brand when you were at the helm was I'm mm. genuinely not quite sure what it is today I haven't been into an Atlanta Hill store for a long time but when it was at its peak how would you describe the style of clothes and the aesthetic that you had because it was completely outside the fashion cycle well, I see, I, I didn't care for fashion. I thought fashion was a bit ridiculous. I didn't care for the... Uh, it was too ordinary. People asking me ordinary questions on the red carpet at David Jones. Like, uh, if someone came towards me and said, what are you showing tonight, Alana, on, on the catwalk? I would freeze. And I'd think, well, oh, God, I've got to talk about fashion. I didn't really know. Because it was so were. ingrained in you. You had four words whenever you yes, it was, designed a collection. It, what were they? It, it was... Uh, Irreverent, ornamental, unique. Rebellious. Rebellious. And the clothing was, because I was I was reinventing myself, I, I wanted to reinvent other girls as well. So when they'd come in the store, and I, I, could, I could see they were a bit low. And, and I'd spend an hour or two with them. I'd, I'd find out all the information. I would go to funerals. I would uh, fix up their marriages or I'd destroy a marriage. I would... Uh, I ch- I, Indigo, I really chummed up with, with customers and that's where I really learnt what women want. Like the transformative effect of clothes. Yeah, it was. So it was like your aesthetic was an over-the-top femininity, flattering, all sizes. Well, I, I guess It was my, very joyful. Because my childhood was so... Div- there was nothing beautiful. There was lino, there was nothing beautiful. And when I got to Melbourne and, and was op shopping... Basically, I, I, my style came from things that I wanted to wear that I couldn't find. I wanted to look like a sailor girl, so I made sailor girl outfits. I loved uh, Malcolm McLaren's Buffalo Girls. I was a Buffalo girl. I liked aprons. I thought I'd make aprons. And then when I got to Factory X, David was, uh, you've got to put 1,500 styles together every six months. And they've got to do accessories. And... And I, that's a lot of styles to put together, 1,500 every six months. Because there are different parts to being in business, isn't there? There's your creative aesthetic and you've got an extraordinary creativity about you and you're smart, but then there's actually running a business and, you know, that doesn't sound like a lot of fun. 1,500 items oh, and you've got no, to do it, this it, and this and that's like scaling is, is, is scaling I found different. It, I, I found it uh, – I did need a boss, David. David, I, I did because I, I, without a boss, I, I've got a bit of a boss complex. Like if I worked for you, even now, when you turned up for work, I'd make sure that I was either windexing, or I was, or I was plaiting some plaiting someone's hair. I was I was cleaning. I can't bear to be, excuse me, lazy. Or so when David said, it's fifteen hundred styles every six months, and there was. I wrote my own press releases. I uh, I ran it completely how I wanted to. And then, you know, we, we would have fights because he'd say, oh, we're, we're going to open in Chadston. I said, no, don't worry. Uh, there's no way I'm opening in Chadston. Three months later, we'd open in Chadston. And then in the last three or four years, he stopped consulting me. So I'd get to work and people would say, mm, you've got two more factory outlets opening and you've got a David Jones opening at High Point and four more somewhere else. And Is that because he wanted to grow it faster than you could keep track of or you didn't want to grow it I anymore? Didn't, I didn't want I, – I wanted to stay as a boutique-style brand. And when I left in 2014, I, I basically had to go, go because I couldn't – I couldn't put my name on things anymore that I, I didn't believe in. Not all founders are – comfortable with or good at the process of scaling up are they and yet the fashion industry in many ways demands it so it's cheaper yes. to in many ways it's cheaper oh, no, to have mi- 20 shops uh, than it is to have one it is i didn't it mind the scaling up down. i didn't because it, the, the more scaling up you know I, I, my wage would increase or i could or i could take a longer holiday from somewhere but i, I was like an employee like i had to clock in I rebelled against that a little bit, but I think that I didn't mind scaling up, but what I minded was 
a David Jones store, concession store next to a boutique, and then a factory outlet next door to that. I thought, this is not really... Uh, his philosophy was probably... That that's what he believed in, but I had a different one, and we really fought about it. And because I, 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 I probably need to be in control, and when I didn't... When I realised I wasn't, all the memories of the childhood would come back, and I... I, f- I panicked and freaked out and thought, I've got, I've got no control. They, they can put my name on anything. And that's, you know, that was, uh, they'd put it on alcohol. It was about to be, put, a lot of teenies were going were gonna to be made. So I, we, well, there were seven months of, of fighting with each other through lawyers and then we made a deal. A deal that he was quite happy with, a deal that I just thought, I I'm, I'm exhausted. So I signed it. I remember distinctly when I used to go to Fashion Week and they would be such kind of staid affairs and everyone would be very sort of up tight in the front row and checking to see where the, who else was sitting in the front row and whether they got better seats than other people and the models would sort of stomp down the catwalk in that very serious way that looked like they were a little bit constipated. Yep. And then your clothes would come out oh, I know. and you wouldn't have clothes – you wouldn't use models, you'd use dancers and they would have different bodies, they were often curvy – and they would launch into a high energy choreographed routine <laughs> and it would blow the lid off this very uptight place. I've got tinkles even thinking about it. Love, I when I used to do a show, because I, I if I do anything, I, I have to do it. It drives people mental. I've got to do it bigger, louder, more incredible than, than And more fun. Yeah, I need I need to have the fashion fun. parades can be very unfun. And I, and I, uh, behind those parades, there was my entire childhood. Was if you if you were a psychiatrist, you could I think is anyone going to pick this up? Because the dancers would come out and do this incredibly flirtatious, and they were very beautiful and curvy. They were like, super sexy. They were incredible, yeah. and they had mirrors. They'd be looking in. They'd be brushing their hair. Their songs would be kitsch. Should be an ABBA song that I that got me through my childhood. And you know, I had signs at the back of those parades saying. You know, at the end of the catwalk, don't do that pouty, that sort of pouty, posy you know, thing. Do some sort of a blow a kiss, or it's, it's a bit dated now, but blow a kiss or pull your skirt up a little bit. Just show off. Just show that you have got the power, that you are incredible, and everyone out there, all you men, you are gonna, they, they, you are so desired by everybody. And that, that, I found that very empowering for them. And then the, model, the models would come out in the clothing. And sometimes models find it hard to take direction, to say, look, can you not just walk like you've got some sort of a stick in behind your, your back? Yeah, in your yeah. bottom. But, and there was a few models, like Miranda Kerr was quite good. She, she, she played yeah. along. And Eva Herzegova, I made her run. I said, you need to run and pretend there's someone chasing you. But even now, I think... It, she, I've got the image of her, of the video of her running down the cat, we're looking behind her, and she did look a bit peculiar. But I realise now she was looking, I made her do that because I was scared. I was scared to look behind me, and so I got her to do it. I, I, I wanted to be able to dance as well as the dancers. I got them to do it. And in, in my head, I was doing it. <laughs> so Fashion parade is therapy. Narcissistic there. <laughs> you had a baby. Was, I did. You were 39 when you got pregnant. I was. Your partner at the time, Carl, was not that keen with on a K, the idea. Please, dear, with a K, K with a Carl. Carl with a K. Carl with a K. Yes. He was not that keen on the idea. And he stated up front, I don't like pregnant women's, women's bodies. I don't no, find them attractive. You didn't. I'm not interested in babies. I'm, the idea of birth horrifies me. But I love you enough. I've been with you for 12 years. I know I'm your last chance. Because you're 39, and I'll throw you a bone. And I look, mean a sperm. Oh yeah, look, and I was, I was, and I actually thought that was completely normal. I was thrilled with it. I thought he is so in love with me. It's ridiculous. <laughs> I can't, what a guy! I can't believe how easy this is. I mean, what? Well, and I rang mum and I said, Mama, I, I might be having a baby. 
No, Lena, you children are dreadful. They're going to ruin your life. He will, he'll have a prolapse. You will have a prolapse. You won't be able to go into full term with it. Your nipples are going to bleed. You'll lose your job. David Heaney will sack you. Carl will leave. The baby will run rings around you. And you haven't even built him a box. Now, the box situation is what my mother put us four children in. She thought it was a good way of keeping us... Corral, is it corral? Yes, we in a corral. box like a pen. It was a beautifully made box, Mum told us. It, it was made by her father and it was a box that we all sat, we were all in and we could look over the top of it. Oh, until what age? Maybe until we were... Mum couldn't really tell us that because she, what what time was I born, Mum? Yeah, you had four, I don't she know. had four what, kids. What do you mean, what time were you born? Who cares what time you were born? Any photographs of us, Mum? I can't see one single photograph. Why should there be? Nothing special about you, dear. You're ordinary and we couldn't afford a camera. So this, if my childhood didn't really exist because there is not a single photograph except one. So you had no blueprint for being a mum. But before oh, we no, even I'd get never to that... A, I'd never even met a baby. I didn't care for babies. I'd never even held a baby. I Why knew, do you want one? Because I couldn't... I started having these incredible fantasies at home alone. Carl was out at nightclubs. And I was actually talking to a small child in my head going, oh, I love you, darling. Would you like a TikTok? Would you like a TikTok biscuit? And I thought, shit, this, this, can't, be the, this can't be the ticking of the clock. I just realised I did that, that the TikTok was probably a Freudian slip. Yeah, the I TikTok did, biscuit and the yeah, TikTok, the TikTok of, of your clock. The clock. And I, I, no one, everyone was against it. No one was, everyone said it's a mistake. Why? Because they thought that I was too old, that Carl would leave, that it was uh, that I'd be a single mother and it'd be a disaster. And I thought, well, they were right about the Carl part. He did I leave. Know, he did, and, and I, I'm glad he did, to be honest, because Ed and I've got a, and Carl's still, he he didn't leave me. He he's, he wanted to be with Ed, sort of. They haven't spoken for about a year because Ed's picked up that mum's mum's doing it. Mum's paying for everything. Mum's mum's doing everything, and and Carl just wasn't. But, but look, he, he was honest with me. He said, "I never promised you a rose garden," and he didn't. And so I went through the, the pregnancy. I was on a diet. I was ashamed about being pregnant because I thought it was too normal. And it wasn't queer enough for me, and it wasn't it, it wasn't quirky to be pregnant. And then I there was a, there was a sense of shame that I wasn't normal enough to have a baby. Isn't that peculiar? That's very complicated. It isn't is. It? It's because I, I because because your whole identity was manifested of about being different. Well, if you're told for years that you're a mongrel bastard. By your parents that you'll never amount to anything that children are a dreadful mistake children will ruin your life no matter how hard you try that voice you know that's that saying you show me a woman a baby a, a girl when she's seven and i'll show you the woman you show me a boy when he's seven and i'll show you the man by the age of seven my dad hadn't spoken to me and we're in we're in two rooms mum was we were having nervous breakdowns and, and, and sad and very disappointed with her life. Dad also, a heartbreak of sorrow, they both were. And, you know, th there's that saying, that just when you think you're done with the past, the <laughs> past isn't done with you. It's How did you learn to be a mum? I didn't. <laughs> you can never learn to be a mum. I, I, I think I've done a... I thought... I bought a couple of baby books and thought... I opened one of them It said... When you have your baby, find a very quiet room. It's a zen room. It'll be your zen space. And just lock yourself in that room and just be zen. I thought, oh, you're off your head. Oh. Yep. Yeah, so what book was that? It's, it's a book. It's, it's a book. So I, I, I did it. I, there was no baby clothes purchased. I didn't have a pram. I didn't really believe there was a baby in the stomach. When I was – because I was doing it all alone. I didn't have – I was at work up until nine months until I was pregnant. Carl left on that pretty much that, in that first that week. week. Yes, and you thought you'd just take a couple of weeks off work. I did. What was your plan for what would happen after Edward was born, or you just didn't make one because you didn't really believe in it until he came? 
I didn't really know what I was going to do because I, I, I didn't know what... Uh, when Edward was born, I didn't write it in the book, but I had a massive anxiety attack. Like, so... Uh, I remember I said to the nurse, you need to close the window. Because they... Uh, mm. I, 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 Carl was there. I knew he was leaving. It was a caesarean. When they placed Edward on me, I, 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 I felt fear. Mm. I felt incredible fear. I didn't feel this incredible love. Mm. I didn't. I do now. But I didn't. Oh, I'm such a sook, sorry, love. Isn't that awful? Poor Edward. And then I just thought, I'm going to do the opposite of mum and dad. I'm going to give, give you everything. <laughs> I'm going to do everything you want. <laughs> when you say... <laughs> Mum, can I have this? Of course you can, darling. When you say, <laughs> Mum, I've got no friends. I'll pay them. <laughs> I'll pay them. Yeah, I'll get hummers for your birthday. I will do everything. And so that would really annoy my mum. I'd ring right. So it's Edward's birthday, Mum. Will, Williams? How old is he? Why did she call him William? I don't know because I think she thought it was royal. I like to think she thought it was royal, William and Edward. <laughs> but, she, you know, he was really go, he was nearly going to be named Rumpelstiltskin, which would have been a disaster. Oh, I yeah. loved that name. Or if it was a girl. It Maybe was a middle name. <laughs> well, you know, and, and but, but I was in hospital like for three or four days and that. I, I only had six outfits. They were, they were, I knew I was having a boy, but I'd, I'd made six beautiful pinky girls' outfits. I'd, I'd f- filled the hospital room with uh, lamps from home. I bought in sheets. I bought in a, a So, a hang coverlet. on, you knew you were having a boy, but you made and brought in girls' outfits. Were I you, did. like, not? I didn't How make, do I say this? Yeah, I know. Well, they, were, they, were boys, they were boys' pants. You know, little pull on my sample machinist and I made. We had four patterns. I said, "Han, we need boys' pants." Um, I, I got four people to knit up jumpers that said, "Edward loves mummy." Okay, so <laughs> in you, a heart, you were but the, <laughs> they weren't really. But they, you know, there was a. I they didn't were jaunty that, clothes. I didn't know that, that when they're born, they have to have a onesie. A, well, I didn't know about that. So he had sort of sparkly. Pants with with a beautiful trim on the bottom, with with pockets, um, a little jacket, a beautiful little hat with ears, and w- when you have a baby, they take you away, him away, and then they they dress him in the clothes. And Edward came back looking like a like a little little freak, really. And I thought, <laughs> you look, I've got to have to step this up with the clothing. But I sort of quite liked it as well. I thought it was a bit. It, it was my way of reinventing myself through a child. That I, I I don't want to, I didn't want to be. I, I wanted to do it in a different way, which I know is a bit odd. How's that gone for you? <laughs> sixteen years later, he's sixteen, so it's probably an unfair time to ask you because, as we you and I have discussed yes. before we started recording, sixteen-year-old boys and fifteen-year-old girls, it's the hardest age. For well, a mum, I think. Well, I think it's hard because I... And for them. I think it's hard for them. Yeah, I do. And, and Ed's alone with me in the house. Well, we, we don't have... I've, I've got a boyfriend, but I've always compartmentalised my life. I don't... I know Hugo won't ever love Edward like I do. I know that he won't... I, I know he'll probably be a bit blasé. I know, you know, if Edward walks in the door, it's like, ha, 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 hello, Ed. You know, I'm, I'm all over him. And I know that... There's, there's something in me that thinks, I, I know you're not going to love him like I do. Is Edward like you? Yes. So he's, like... He's very... He's, uh, he's very... He's got a... He's, 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 uh, he, he's a little bit... He's a bit of a hippie, actually. He's a free spirit. He wants to... He hates the Matrix. He hates nine to five. You know, he's only just 16 and it's... He's quite judgman, judgmental. He, he writes a lot. He writes the most incredible... He, he writes incredibly well. You know, when you were saying you projected your childhood onto him mm, and you dressed him in all these things and you gave him everything. what you wanted. I think in some way, in part, we all do that mm. to a point. And then your child gets to the point. It's a mistake. Yeah, but it's just kind of it, what it's happens. You, you, it's, you, I couldn't change. I couldn't have done it any and then other way. they get to a point where they're like, no, I don't want to wear that. 
I don't want to go there. I don't want to do that. When did he start to sort of assert himself and be who he is rather well, than mini a, you? Yeah, well, he's a Scorpio. So it happened at about six. He was, you know, he he wouldn't wear the bowed pants. He... He, he really only had one outfit to choose from, which was a Spider-Man outfit, which he wore for two years, which was almost a, a, a shaggy – it was a piece of uh, – he couldn't even – it was a rag. But he, that's what he wore for two years. Lisa it, Wilkinson once told me if there's if there's ever a piece of your child's clothing that you hate, it's something they were given yes. or whatever, get rid of it because you can be sure they will love it and they will wear it every day for two I years. I hid it. But I had a sister who helped me raise Edward who was had the same childhood as me. So we both were in – You know, I was competitive for my father's love, which she got. So watching her and Edward – form an incredible relationship and they really did because she was she, she's never had children she's not interested in children she's a year older so and even when I was eight months pregnant she said when are you going to get that aborted what are you when are you going to kick nature in the face and get it's just so that, not that, the maternal type she's not maternal she she told me that the baby if I died no the baby and I were both in competition and the baby would always try and win out if I if there was a death if I was going to die the baby would try and beat me to to live and she said it's sucking the life out of you but when he was born because she loved dad and he looked a little bit like dad and he died like a year earlier and she was very grateful that I would said look to replace dad that I know you love I'll have a child and so to her she, she picked on me the whole way through the pregnancy but then when he was born it was she adores she, look at his little toes look at the way he walks I don't mind if he breaks every single thing on that mantelpiece he's still adorable look he just smacked somebody in the head isn't he gorgeous Lan don't give him more give him more food give it like it was we're both competitive with him so he was raised with these two mad women just fawning over him he couldn't even walk down he couldn't make a step because it was, look at the way he took that step. You're such a free spirit. Did you raise him in a free spirit style? Like were there rules and bedtimes? There and was. There was. I was quite... So you weren't like a free range parent? Uh, no, no. I've, I've taught him manners. I've um, I've taught him morals. I, I really teach him about women. Boundaries I really and do. guidelines. And, and what I love most about him is the other day... His friends were a bit rappy and they made a rap song which was quite derogatory about women. It was like bitches and mm. and Ed just said, Mum, I, I can't listen to it because I, it's disrespectful. And I said, repeat it, Ed. It's what? He said, I just don't think it's a good way to talk about women. And Babe, your work is done. I did. I just, I, your I did. work here is done. I, I, I actually lay down. I never lay down. And I, I fluffed myself up and he's, and he's so on to me. He said, <laughs> Mum. I know you're taking the credit for this. And I said, well, dear, I'm sorry, but I am. I said, I'm thrilled with that, Ed. And then I push him a bit more. I said, Ed, so what do you think about women? He said, I, I, he said, Mum, it's getting a bit weird. I said, no, Ed, I need to know more. Do to see how good I am as a mother. Do you, when you see women, you wouldn't just, you wouldn't just call a woman a bad name, would you? You would never do that, would you, Ed? No, no, I, I wouldn't, Mum. I wouldn't, but I, I, I do get he's got a girlfriend and he said, I'm, I'm struggling with jealousy. So we, we, we're very open. But mm. he, I think that biggest heartbreak for women who have a child, especially if they do it alone, no one tells you. You only get them really for 10 years, 11 years. And then it's just the rejection of don't pick me up at school. I don't like that ball gown, mum. Do not come at 3.30 in a ball gown. The kids think you're a bit of a vampire, mum. Um, that, that, that is, and at 16, it's really tough because it's, it's, you've got to let me go a bit, mum. You're holding on and you're going to lose me. So just bear through this last year, mum, and I will get better. I, and I said, Ed, I, 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 you know, he, he, and I, I let him go out a bit. I am quite free with him because I, I, I He's know 16. That I know. And it's I, all right. And I do try very hard not to say, when I was 16, I was living in a bedsit alone. 
I might be. You know, kids love hearing that. They love hearing I about ne- what never, we were like when we were kids. Never, I love it. I, I try not to do it, but but he's quite um. You know, we we, have, we don't have relatives. My family don't speak to me, so I I worry that he's quite al- alone. Has he seen you without makeup? Once. When? Look, he was about three, and I took the risk of having something called a face mask. I thought, oh, I've seen those masks. That's another form of a mask. I'll pop one of them on. And I, look, I popped it on. It was green, and I wiped it off, and I looked at the girl underneath, and I thought, who the hell are you? But it was me. And I, and I, I thought, Edward had woken up, and I thought, take the risk. So I picked him up and took him up to his cot. And I didn't have any makeup on. And he looked at me and he, he said, maybe he was four, and he said, ah, who are you? <laughs> and I thought, shit. Oh. But even so, even if, even if he comes home, and I'm, I'm a lot better than I used to be. Like, I really am. Uh, Hugo has convinced me that I'm quite beautiful without makeup. I can see under your no, makeup. There's, there's, like I can see. Yeah. You've got you are beautiful. I'm not. You've got beautiful bone structure. You've got a beautiful face and your eyes, the irony of you going on about your eyes. You've got these gorgeous green, is it green? Yeah, green they're green, eyes. they're green. They're beautiful. They really? But you won't ever think that. I I do for a minute. Do you? If I look at a photograph that I've completely doctored and photoshopped to hell with my new apps, I think, yeah, you, Stretched, you look quite good. And then Edward will say, Mum, the dog's legs are about 10 feet high because you've stretched that photo. <laughs> I said, Edward, I have not stretched that <laughs> photo. It's a bit of a giveaway. I have not stretched that photo. But Do you think you have body dysmorphia? What's that called again, love? Body dysmorphia. My sister's got that. When you look in the mirror and you see something different to, what's, to what everyone else sees, whether it's your face or your body... So you think I don't. I don't look at the mirror when I'm done up and think I'm I'm, I'm ugly or I've got bad. I, I can see what you, when you say it, I think oh she's seen she's seen my how well I put my mask on. She's no, seen. I can see under it. Yeah, we well, see. I just think you might be lying to me, love. You lie. <laughs> I can hear my mum. She's lying to you, Len. She's just trying to get you to open up because she's the mum of Mia, <laughs> <laughs> and she's not from Abba. <laughs> She's really not. No. The so I think that being a mum really does, it, it refurbishes your entire life. And I, then I fell madly. I actually fell in love and I still am a bit in love with him. I actually am in love with him. When he says, yeah. mum, you're a bit jealous that I'm going out with April tonight. I think, oh, no, I'm not, Ed. I'm not. And I think, I may be. Well, because we think we've created the perfect man. I don't I think, think I've, I don't think he's perfect. I really don't. Well, not perfect. I don't, but I don't like, care. I don't care for the women who say, "Oh, my child is perfect." I loved it. No, I don't mean that they're you perfect. You did, dear. You said the child was perfect. You think your child's perfect? <laughs> oh my god, I'm talking to your mum. <laughs> your mum's yeah, throwing my shade mommy, on me. She, she is. <laughs> what were we saying? That I can't remember. Yeah. Should we talk about? Um, what can we talk about? That's no, quite I've got a question. Oh, have you good? So, um. At one stage during the height of things um, when your career was um, going gangbusters. I love you. You've gone back 20 minutes. I love it. <laughs> I know. You were walking down a red carpet. I was. At a David Jones fashion parade, which happens twice a year. And it was just after the then CEO, Mark McGuinness, had been um, accused of sexual harassment and had stepped down and there was a big legal case underway. And... You were asked a whole bunch of questions about that on the red carpet. What did you say and what happened after that? Thanks for bringing that up, Maya. That's just lovely. Terrific. Well, well, that was one of the most shameful days of my life. And that day was pretty much the day that everything changed for me at work. My whole life was changed by that dumb, stupid thing I said. And what happened was, uh, you know, I, I... there was the morning of the David Jones show. I hadn't read the papers. We got to the show and there was all the media. There was a wall of media. I thought I was at a party. I forget. I, even now I forget that there's people out there listening. I think we're just in a little room. Uh, so the wall of photographers were – I was watching Carla Zampati walk through and they were all asking her the question – and she was very professional. They said, what do you think of the Mark McGuinness uh, claims, uh, Carla? Black. I like black. 
I like cocktail dresses. I thought she hasn't even answered the question. She's a professional. She's clever. She's good. And then they got to me and I think they thought, oh, well, they saw me coming. And I wish I had seen myself coming because I walked in with Alex Perry, who I don't know very well. And because I have to appear larger than life, it, because I think I'm invisible, and so everything's got to be larger than life. When they said to me, Alana, Alana, well, she'll answer something good. Alana, what do you reckon, David Jones? What, what do you reckon about that? And I, it was terrible what I said. But I, I, I said, I wish he touched me up. But what I really meant, what I really meant was he rejected me. Like my father rejected me. And I thought, why can't all the uh, feminists see that I, I'm actually struggling? Uh, it's nothing about Kirsty Fraser Smith. Was that her name? Yeah. And I know what it, what it must have been like for her to be uh, under threat or feel, feel under mm. threat at work. But I also liked Mark a lot. I did. And the two things can be true. Uh, uh, and he was always very nice to me. And, uh, and uh, because I've got a boss complex... And he was a big boss. He'd sit with me on the front row and say, oh, your dancers are great. You've done a great job. Your clothes are selling. You're great. And so when that happened and I said, look, I wish you'd touch me up, I – then they went on to say, are, are you the girl with the brun- – are you the brunette? I said, no, he didn't. No, I'm not the brunette. There was – because there was a brunette that someone that was involved. And I, w- I sat at the seat, at my seat, and sat to Jackie fr- next to Jackie Frank, the editor of Marie Claire. Yeah, and, and I s- you knew I did that you'd said something. I was sweating. I was sweating. And this was before social media. It was, it was like ten years ago. So it was 2011. And that's I remember when it happened to you, and you left in the middle of the show because you started to freak out I and did. have an anxiety attack, and you went back to your hotel room, and, and by that stage, it was already all over the news, and. That is one of the early episodes of public shaming mm. and pylons that I think I can remember um, in terms of it was just an avalanche of negative was. media and it was you must apologise and there were calls to boycott your stores and it you mu- I, can't, I, I can't imagine how you feel. Mm. I was so... T- I- because I, half of the, half of women who are older were saying, it was just a throwaway comment. We say things all the time. I comforted myself with that. But then... The righteous indignation. I did, I, and I... And, I, and people who thought you were making light of... Yes. You it know. Was a ter- it, it really... It, but it, I guess it, there was no benefit of the doubt given... It was a terrible thing to say. To it, it really was. But I... And you apologised immediately. And, and But then David... Went a little bit too far. We have a sorry sale. You've got a. There was a sorry sale. There, there was a there? sorry sale, but there was. We had, he donated all the money because he was convinced, and he st- he's still convinced that that one episode was why he became so controlling over the brand because he lost trust in you. Yeah, he did, and I sort of understand that. By 2013, yep. you had parted ways with the brand that. You started that yes. had your name, yes, and you started again. I did. I I let myself fall apart in a bath. If something really bad happens to me and I feel powerless, and I'm brought back to what happened when I was a child, because it, it never really leaves. And and I I'm not defined by the abuse. I'm I'm really not. But if something where I feel powerless happens in my life, I'm it's like elastic time. It, it's it was this colossal event that I'm always drawn back uh, in time to that one event. And everything else is all right. Everything else is okay around me. But that one event just, oh, it was, I, I never really, I never really thought I'd see the day when I, I'd, I'd walk away and not f- go to work. But I, I was devastated that someone else was going to be me. And take the credit for me, and I wasn't really allowed to say anything. And look, I, I wasn't wealthy, but I loved I loved clothing, and I had to reinvent. And I was I was distressed for for about six months, and then I started Louise Love. I borrowed money from the house on on the house, and I was so excited, and. 
But the truth is, I needed a David or someone to do the business side of it because I, I, you, you can't be creative and do business. You can, but so I was doing both. People thought I had about 10 staff at Louise Love. It was just me. You know, I was so used to travelling first class. Now, I know this is going to sound terrible to some girls, but when you work for maybe 35 years full-time at Indigo and, you know, I, I, I did have a nanny. I had a, a gardener and a cleaner. And so I, I didn't have to go to the shops, really. And so when I left, I had no gardener, there was no nanny, there was no cleaner. I, and I know it sounds terrible, but I, I was lost. Was that the worst of it, though, or was it identity? Oh, the identity. The identity and was, somewhere to be every day. And, and worried about money. Mm. And, and I would drive to... Uh, I, I was so ashamed. I, I, I suffer from quite a bit of shame, but I, I was so ashamed that Hugo, my boyfriend, would see me so devastated because he was like, just... You've got to live beyond the brand. Something great's going to happen. Start Louise Lava, you know. And I did it in a way that cost so much money because I was used to using the most expensive photographers, the most beautiful models. And so I, I, I did all that. But before I did it, I was I stayed in bed for a week. I cried myself to sleep. I was, I was, I was, I wanted to die. With mum's death and that, I just thought, I'm going to die. So I had planned it. I did. I had watched a video of mum with my friend Nat. I had one friend and all my friends were at work. My whole life was at work. I mean, I made sure that Alana Hill, all the girls that worked at Alana Hill were my best friends. Uh, if one of them left, I'd take it personally. I'd, I'd be walking around saying, she's leaving, you've got to give her more money. David, she's leaving, she's gonna, you've got to give her more money. Uh, and he'd say, you've got to let people go, Alana. No, 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 I can't let people go. And and I think he probably played on that a bit because he could see I was, I was vulnerable, but tough. And so I came home and I struggle. I really, it's one of the biggest struggles of my life. And I, it's hard to put into words. How did you pull yourself out of it? I think I, I looked in the mirror and thought, I've, I've got to, I've, I have to believe in myself. I have to reinvent myself again. I can easily slip off this road. I can go down a very dark path, but I've got Edward and Edward needs me and I need to be, I need to be strong for him. And sometimes, you know, because <laughs> he's a Scorpio, I would drive past the store late at night and I'd, I'd stare in and nothing was mine anymore. I had my name on it. I was devastated and I'd say, Ed, what, 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 what do you think of the window? And he said, it just looks like yours. I said, that's not, it does not, it's very different. But I, you know. Poor my, thing, it's probably like, what's the right oh, answer? No, and, I, and I still miss it. Like I miss yeah. that. You know, it's, it's very lonely writing a book. It's very isolating. It takes a lot of nerve to write down your darkest thoughts. I knew that I would, the few, the little life I did have. It was it was a big life, but I, you know, I, I don't go out a lot. I don't go to events. I don't have people over. If someone knocks on the door, I completely freak out. I think I'm wary. I'm wary of women who are not wary, but when girls have got lots of friends at my age, I think, oh, I, I won't be able to be their best friend. They've already got all their best friends. I'll just be a hanger on. I'll be a third wheel. And so I think mm, I can't be friends with them because. Have I'm you got friends? <laughs> Who are you? There's friends? a long pause there. There's a long <laughs> pause there because uh, this is going to be hard to admit. I, I could have a lot of friends if I wanted. So like people invite me out all the time. I'm invited out quite regularly. I'm, my mother has entered my body because I'm feeling a bit insecure. <laughs> I don't have a lot of friends, but I also pride myself on that because I think uh, for me to have a good friend, I have to put a lot of time into them. I'm not interested in them in a phone call going, how are you today? I'm going to go for a run around the tan or around the botanical garden, then I'm going to go for a coffee, then I might go and visit my parents. Even that would hurt me because I think they're going to visit parents. They're going to go, oh, they're normal, they're going to go for a run the tan. I'm, I'm at home sort of making clothing and looking out for Ed and, and I, didn't, I wasn't part of any women's group. 
or mother's group because I, I found it too terrifying. And Are you like, happy in your own company? I do. I love being alone. Mm. I love it. And I admire people who like being alone. And I think some of the best people are lonely. You know, Do you feel lonely or just like being alone? Because there's a difference. I really thought after writing the book that I would feel this incredible, cathartic, incredible relief. <laughs> but yeah, no, that doesn't happen. <laughs> no, no. All it filled me with was this sense of terror and, oh, my God, Hardy Grant, do you really think we've, we've got to go out now and it's not going to ever appear on a shelf. It was a bit like the baby. Edward's never really going to come out. I won't really have to raise him. And I look at the schedule from Hardy Grant and I think, oh, I, I, will, I, will, I, will the book even be on the shelf? No one's going to be coming to the events. And then I go to the events and girls are crying. There's, there's cues of girls signing for the books. They're all uh, – uh, and that's part of the reason I wrote the book was to – not to show off, not to blab about my story – I wanted people to understand that I wasn't just this tizzy designer that said this stupid thing. For I, what I, it's I worth, I'd forgotten about that I, until I, wanted, I read it in the book. I wanted, I think I've, I wanted validation because well, my parents, my mum and dad, never believed, never, uh, never saw anything. So even when you're t- talking about this, I'm filled up with this sort of love. I, I feel, I feel loved. When I leave, it'll go. But I'll, I'll, I'll probably cuddle up to the poor PR girl. <laughs> and, and, uh, talking about it makes me feel loved. Try to come back to it because you should. Can you sit here for the next 48 years with me and just talk <laughs> yes. about it? And then we'll feel loved together. But yes. see, you feel loved, don't you? Do you genuinely feel loved? What an interesting question. Yeah, I do. Who? I do. I feel loved who by loves, my parents. Who loves you, dear? My parents. Oh, why don't you make me sick? I had parents <laughs> who said... Who refused to hear a bad word. I mean, I was a little shit. See, what does that But my parents refused to hear. I was still shits to them. They still annoyed me sometimes. See, the worst thing is that mum and dad were so vile to me that I was a suck up. And it's really interesting because I've got friends and I know people who have had terrible parents and parents who were horrid to them, like like Mm. your mother was to you and your father. And they have been apoplectic with grief when their parent has died. Polar. And I've come to understand that it's the grief for the parent that they weren't. And well, the, there's a part of you that always hopes and dreams right up until they're dead that they will say, God, I'm proud of you. God, I love you. Ooh. You're amazing. Ooh, I'd die. I would die if, someone said, if my mother said that. And I think that n- when they are gone... The hope of that is gone and you become a child again and that's why the grief can be so, in a way, more powerful if you have a terrible relationship with a parent than if you're really close. I know. When when mum died at work, a girl said, this is going to be so much harder for you, Alana, because you haven't got a good relationship with your mum. And I I, I said, I have. I I fooled myself. I said, my mum, I talk to her, I tell her everything. And it came as a terrible, terrible blow that... You know, that, 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 that grief was, it was oceanic. But, you know, I only saw mum six days a year for 45 years, so it was, what was the question? <laughs> Am I just the worst person in the world? Not at all. We should call this episode, what's the question again? <laughs> And, and I can't remember because yeah. I'm with you. I Wherever know. we've gone, I'm there I with know. you. I think the thing uh, with with mum, I, I think mum holds the key to the past. She really does. And even though my relationship with dad was probably worse because he, he was just a bit cruel and neglectful and uh, I found his behaviour toward me just... so dark but because mum was a little bit fun and a bit you know I'd walk in and she'd say how are you lad did anyone look at you down the street and I'd be and I'd say yeah mum Mrs Barrett saw me did she take you out of twist dear did she say you look stupid dear and I think oh god I thought she was excited that someone had seen me down the street but she's turned that around to they mock they're gonna mock you 
Um, I took her. She was unspeakably cruel, but she kind of, I don't in a larger than life way, like almost with humour, which makes it very hard to just call it out as cruelty. It, see, I didn't find it cruel, but I guess it was a bit. It, I just did one was a weekly article, and they said she was cruel, and I was really. She was. I thought, is that, is that cruel? Oh, but. I don't know what it was, but cruel. I, it was cruel. Cruel, cruel. cruel I can't is what quite it was. admit it. It's cruel. Can't admit it. She was cruel to you. Cruel. Well, uh, she took me. I took her maybe four years ago. I said, "Mum, you need to come and see my success. I need to show you. I need to show that I haven't just got one shop. I, I do." And so I brought her over. It, it was a dreadful trip because I, I, we drove past Chapel Street, and I said, "Mum, there's the store." What's your name on the window for, dear? Is you, what's your name on the shoes? What they got your name on everything for? And I thought, she just doesn't get it. So then I, I just opened a store at, at Doncaster and I drove her out. She smoked smoked all the way there in my, in my new Mercedes with the sunroof off, smoking a little saucer under her chin so she could get to the – there wasn't so far to ash. <laughs> I thought, what's the saucer there? And I thought, she can't be bothered going further down. It's under her chin. So – she smoked all the way there. We got to the um, the Doncaster, and because she's from Tasmania, like, land, 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 get that. There's an Asian coming to. Is an Asian? Is an Asian walking towards me? I said, Mum, I've arranged a wheelchair for you. I don't, will not be pushed by an Asian. Look at the confidence of them, land. Oh, purchasing things in shops with credit cards. Who do they think they are? And I'm like, you keep it to a dollar or Mum, because. I've got a bit of a name. When you get in, she's in a wheelchair. I'm pushing her around Doncaster. We get to my store. Mum didn't speak, and I thought, oh, this is going to. Mm. She's her overcome. In. She's that she, impressed. She, she's overcome because it's so beautiful. I wheel her in. She picks up. The, unfortunately, that day the girls in the store weren't quite as overwhelmed by me as they usually are. It's usually Alana. You've come in. How great! But for some reason, it was just hi, Alana. And I thought, no, you need to be more of a fast mum. The mother's here. Mm. And mum's already picking up a pair of stockings. $29 for pantyhose with your name on them. Ridiculous. I open the stock room and say, mum, this is the stock room. Oh, dear, Len. Look at all the clothes not selling. Out the back, not selling. And I thought, that's pretty good. I said, mum, it's selling so well, I have to have a stock room with backup stock. You can't fool an old fool, dear. The stock isn't selling. And then I wheeled her out and I, she was still smoking. And I said, Mum, what did you think? And she looked at me and said, well, dear, do you know what? I don't think your staff think much of you. And I said, that's it, Mum? Do you like the window? Well, it's not yours, dear. No, it's not yours. And it was very, very heartbreaking, that little conversation. But then uh, there were times when I'd go back and I'd, I'd, Mum would look at me and say, how old are you now, dear? I'd say, oh, 47. She said, stand up. Turn, give me a turnaround. And I'd stand up and I'd show her my breasts because I was still quite good. And I'd, I'd do a spin and she'd say, not bad, lad. You're not doing too bad for a 48-year-old. You're not doing too bad. So she wasn't always cruel. There was, you know... No, sometimes she also she objectified was, she you. Was, cool. Gee, yeah, that's see the therapist said as well. He said I, I couldn't accept it. I, 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 you still there's that part of you. Yeah. And the six days I went back, I was still looking for validation yeah. from mum and the love from dad. And I think you always will be. I, I will. And and I think that's it's probably something that upsets me the most. Well, they're not around. Is to your mum you. dead? No. Oh, you could get uh, girls. I just need to tell everyone mm. if you have any. Any uh, problems with your mum or you're estranged, ring them. Ring them and just try and sort it out because I didn't. And when that phone call came, I was devastated. (laughs) And, of course, I tried to make it all fine by getting a more expensive coffin, more flowers. I thought there was going to be 600 people at the church in Elveston, Tasmania. (laughs) I was very surprised that there was 30 I thought, where's everybody? <laughs> My mum's incredible. <laughs> and I was just... <laughs> she, the funny thing was that she, she'd already told me a month earlier that there's a black priest down at the church land. He's black. I, how could a priest be black? 
She's horrified. I can't believe there weren't more people at her funeral, quite frankly. Either She's such I. a delight. She was. But my excitement that mum disliked this black priest and he buried her. <laughs> and I thought, he's throwing incense on the coffin. And I thought, and, and it was very sad because my oldest brother who died had such issues with mum. He didn't come to her funeral. And he only texted us five minutes before it started and said, I'm not coming. I hated her. And she's a bitch. And and then he died three weeks ago. And I thought, you both didn't go to each other's funerals. <laughs> it's, and I didn't go to his funeral. It's quite odd. But, you know, I, I, mum, mum, mum was sort of, I thought mum was a daughter. Mum was sort of liked in the town for being a bit of a character. She was a character. Cruel character. I, I get Very it. Very cruel character. I get it, yeah. I get it. You should be enormously proud of this. Your parents might not be around to tell you how brilliant it is. And even if they were, they wouldn't have told you that. No. But I hope all the people that come and see you and buy the book and read it and contact you fill you up with some of that love. That you've, got, you've got tears in your eyes. You so much You have got have. tears in your eyes, Mayor Friedman. Absolutely, I do. <laughs> You're a little bit in love with me, let's face it. Just a little bit. <laughs> See, I tried to be a lesbian for a long time. How'd that go? She died. <laughs> How grim. How, now, that's why. Go and read this book, girls, and really cheer yourselves there up. There are some laughs in this book, oh, I love really love need it. to Look, say. It is there's hilarious. funny part. It is. And there, there's a resolution at the end. Yeah. Where, and also, you're just a kick ass writer. Yeah, I'm a kick ass writer. You're a kick ass writer. Yeah, look at me. Uh, my mascara's down my, my mum's face. I, I'm, I'm quite emotional. It's because you've, I can feel that you, you, you really believe what you're saying. Yeah, of course. And I'm a little bit jealous that you love your mother loves you. I'm a little bit pissed off about that, actually. <laughs> I'm going to have to ring her up and tell her the truth. You know what's <laughs> going to piss you off more is now I'm going to say we have to take a photo together. I'll just have to fix my eyes because I, I, I have not cried yet once. Have you? I'm crying. No. Are you? What's wrong with me? What's happened to me? Your eyes are actually great. No, there's a whole thing going on there. I've gone Sultana. I haven't okay. gone Sultana. Okay. I've been watching. They haven't been. It had, you haven't Casey has had to watch me every gone down your face. Sure Sorry, I'm still in the How awesome is she? You can find Butterfly on a Pin, which is the most beautifully written, engaging book. She's got such an original style. Not since I read Magda Zhivansky's memoir, have I been so struck by someone who is not known as a writer, how great they are at writing. There are a lot of celebrity memoirs that are ghostwritten, which is totally fine. Not everybody's a writer. But this book is just fantastic. I highly, highly recommend it. You can find it at any good bookstore or at apple.co forward slash mummia. No Filter is produced by Eliza Ratliff this week and every week. I'm Mia Friedman and I will see you on the homepage, mamamia.com.au.